All right, guys, so we can go ahead, I think, um, get started. Um, I'm just gonna kind of just first introduce myself. So my name is Katherine Clark and I work at Sarah, Virginia. I am the Young People in Recovery Program Coordinator. I am particularly excited about being on this call because I am brand new to all of this. Um, I started about four months ago and it's been a really great learning experience. And I really think that um, this seminar tonight is gonna be great for me and hopefully everybody can get a bunch out of this. Um, so I'm gonna kind of, we have, for those that are still joining us, um, we are recording this session. So it'll be on our website um, as well as on social media. And kind of the game plan of today is our speakers are gonna, we're gonna be asking some questions to the speakers. Um, and any questions that I ask, feel free to elaborate. Um, they're kind of straightforward questions. So um, it would be helpful, I think, to the participants. Um, if we could elaborate some, tell personal experiences. Um, Lindsay and myself, who said, she says she's Sarah Virginia, um, but that's Lindsay Jefferson. She works for Sarah as well. We're kind of both going to be looking at the chat. So as questions arise, um, just feel free to um, enter them in the chat. And towards the end of the session, we are going to hopefully be able to answer some of those questions for you um, if everybody's up for that. <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of just go over. And it, I'm sorry for my voice. I had a horrible cold and got sick. So I'm trying to, you know, get it together. <laughs> so thank you all for your patience. Um, so kind of the objectives of this event, and then I am going to introduce our speakers as well. Um, so we are really trying to see how the, the community um, feels about sharing their own story and our voice um, and becoming advocates. Um, another point is understanding the basics of what advocacy is, which is something that I could definitely use. Um, the different types of advocacy and how it really looks like when you're practicing advocacy. Um, a deeper level of understanding of the legislation, leg, legislative session um, and how to su successfully advocate through it. I think Melina may have um, some good knowledge on that. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to touch on that as well. Um, Daquan Love, are you on here? Okay. I am. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, I can. Hi. How are you? Sorry. Um, did not know you were going to be jumping on, so I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you made it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to first introduce Daquan Love. Um, and if you would just like to tell us a little bit about yourself um, and then we can get started on the questions. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. I'm Daquan Marcel Love, Executive Director of the Virginia State Conference in AACP, where I oversee the work of more than 110 branches, youth councils, and uh, college chapters of the NAACP here in this Commonwealth. Um, and you'll see I'm actually on the road in the field uh, today, as it is National Voter Registration Day, and our our latest total shows that NAACP units across the Commonwealth have registered over 1,400 new voters. And so um, I hope that you will apologize, I hope that you will forgive me rather uh, for the background um, today. But I'm so excited to be with Sarah this evening uh, as we talk about advocacy and the important work of this organization. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so one question that I do have is about a year ago, I think you became the youngest state um, executive director in the, in the NA, um, AACP um, history. So I was just wondering how um, you were able to do that and how that, um, how you hold that title and consider advocacy to be a big part of your every day-to-day -day work. Absolutely. Well, you know, before I came along, the youngest executive director or executive secretary of an NAACP unit was Medgar Evers. And I uh, was 
actually able to uh, outdo his record um, in serving as the youngest state executive director of the NAACP here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That was done, um, frankly, because of the fact that um, I have extensive experience working with the NAACP um, since childhood, uh, working my way up through the local, state, and national levels uh, to becoming a member of the National Board of Directors, and in my personal and professional capacities, having worked in the political uh, spectrum and, and having the many opportunities to serve that way, and, and, and the stars aligned, and uh, my calling was made to, to serve in this august role that I take very seriously. Thank you. Um, I think a lot about advocacy is kind of can be kind of exposing to some people. Um, so being an advocate, um, be, does it push you personally and out of your comfort zone? Um, being in front of an audience, I know for me, being in front of an audience is kind of terrifying. Um, so if you could just share a little bit about that. Um, what kind of physical settings um, that you have, public, virtual, um, what do you think is both most effective? Um, anything on that? Absolutely. You know, we have a credo in the NAACP, a poem that states uh, the, it's called the NAACP Soldiers Credo. And I really believe that to be the mantra that guides the work that I do. Um, the NAACP, we must be advocates and speaking up for those who are voiceless. We must be um, uh, the advocates for positive social change and we must promote um, uh, justice and equality in our, in our commonwealth and in our community. And so for me, being an advocate means speaking up for those who aren't able to be at the committee hearings. Uh, being an advocate means speaking up for those who aren't able to speak directly to their legislators. Being an advocate to me means that we are standing up for the, uh, against the masses to be a voice for the few. Uh, and so being that advocate for radical positive change is really a calling. It can't just be a, a job or a nine to five. Um, it has to be a calling in which one is um, divinely appointed to do this great work. I really love that. I think that, um really speaks to the work that you're doing over there. Um, that is really incredible. Um, one thing I think in the past year, maybe like, maybe the difference between like the pre-pandemic and how it is today, um, do you think people are more active in advocacy um, because of the social um, problems of today? Um, how have you seen things change since the pandemic? Um, has it made things more difficult? Um, are people more open or what kind of things are you seeing? You know, what I'm seeing across the Commonwealth now is there is more, there are more opportunities for folks to get engaged and involved. Whereas in the past, folks had to uh, find their way to a 6 a.m. meeting at the Pocahontas building at the state capitol, people are now able to advocate virtually and provide their public comments in a written format. They're able to uh, share with their legislators in more ways um, than one of uh, what their positions are and what positions they're advocating for their legislators to take hold of in the General Assembly. And so what I would say is that as we move out of this COVID-19 reality, um, and obviously there's still social distancing and, and other COVID-19 measures that we have to take uh, a fa in, into a factor um, in, into this situation. We have to be mindful that this is our opportunity to advocate on behalf of our communities. And so if anything, the COVID-19 reality has simply given us more opportunities, different opportunities to express our, um, our opinions, to the legislators that we are working with. And I would hope that we as advocates would find ways to engage with our communities so that they can advocate um, uh, to their legislators in new and exciting ways. So in the past, um, for example, you know, we would have folks to call their legislators and that might be it. Nowadays, we are encouraging folks 
to submit uh, a written comments to their legislators. We are encouraging folks to tweet and Instagram and other means of so social media to contact their legislators. And so if anything, the COVID-19 reality has opened up new doors of opportunities for us to advocate. But nevertheless, we will advocate uh, on social media, we'll advocate in public comment, we will advocate in email, phone, and text, and every other medium that we have so that our message can get through and our mission can be accomplished. So I'm just hearing the passion, right? I just love that. Um, so I know um, somebody who's passionate. So like, as for me, I'm passionate about um, advocating for substance use disorder, right? Um, so that is what we do at Sarah. Um, so how do you personally um, come up with um, different ideas? You know, I think some of us get really fed up with the empty promises um, of politicians who just want to get reelected, right? Um, how do we advocate um, for for the population um, without, you know, I mean, looking at the big picture, you know, um, not just playing politics, but we're actually advocating. Um, how do you fight against the cynicism? Um, you know, I mean, things change and we have to get up from defeat. You know, things don't always go as planned. Um, so how do we continue to advocate? Well, you know, here's what we've got to do. First off, we've got to make sure we're engaged throughout the entire legislative process. Um, and making sure we're talking to legislators before session and during session. Um, I think that the mistake that uh, so many folks make is, you know, coming right when bills have already dropped. Once the bill has dropped, you know, the, 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 the policy making is pretty much done. Um, at that point, it's just negotiating. I'm sure that other folks on the panel uh, might be able to share uh, their experience and, and that I know we have some policy uh, directors on the panel as well. But a, what I would say, we have got to remain vigilant throughout the entire legislative process. And that includes talking to legislators before session. That's the most impactful way that we can uh, impact the upcoming legislative session. That was actually very helpful for me personally, um, you know, being able to reach out to, legis I mean, legislators are busy, right? Um, so being they able are. to, being able to catch them and engage them before they get overwhelmed, um, I think is a really great way um, to push advocacy. Um, so I just kind of want to open up the floor um, and see if anybody has any questions so far. Um, Otherwise, we can move on. I'll give you all a couple seconds. Anything you'd like him to elaborate on? All right. Um, Ms. Malia Lanos, um, I just would like to give you the floor to first introduce yourself. Um, yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Melina Llanos. I am, uh, I serve a few different roles. Um, I'm currently the Chief of Staff for Senator Jeremy McPike in the Virginia State Senate. Um, he represents Prince William, Manassas City, and uh, Manassas Park. Um, I am also the Political Director for the Virginia Young Democrats, the largest um, youth organization under the Democratic Party. Um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, and I am the president of the Metro Richmond Area Young Democrats. Um, it was probably one of my favorite titles. Oh, wait, this is being recorded. I was going to say, don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, but we are a Young Democrats chapter um, covering Hanover County to Powhatan to Petersburg um, to Henrico um, and just kind of very large uh, central geographic region. Um, I have done a bit of field organizing. I've done community organizing. Um, I've done uh, organizing and reproductive rights with Planned Parenthood. I served as the uh, chapter president when I was at VCU. So I've got a little bit of uh, 
everything in there. Um, so that's kind of, I bring that to my experience in my job. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about me. You were gonna. Thanks yeah. <laughs> for sharing that. So I'm hearing a lot, like I'm hearing a lot of different um, areas. So one thing I'm wondering is like, how does your chief of staff role compare to um, your involvement with the Metro Area Young Democrats? Um, obviously, you seemed a little biased there. So I would love to hear, um, you know, a little bit more about how um, how you see your role in both. Um, so as far as like comparing it, um, it's definitely very different. Um, chief of staff is like the government part of Things that I'm involved in, um, and then the metro uh, area and Democrats. I call it M rate. So if I just for folks in the audience, um, it's a lot more advocacy as well as um, organizational and kind of, but I guess not exactly. Hmm, what am I trying to say here? It's kind of a mix of a lot of different things. It's trying to be productive and. Uh, advocate to our delegation. So we've got a lot of allies um, that support Young Democrats and also bringing issues to them. Um, one of kind of an example, we have uh, our monthly meetings and we bring legislators to those every single month. And at the end, you know, we get young professionals that are sharing, hey, I'm having a problem with this and it's a state issue. Um, and kind of just being the bridge to connect uh, young folks to uh, the legislative branch. I think we're in a weird um, kind of space because we're not like high schoolers. So people never throw like education on us as far as like platforms and policy issues. Um, and then we're not, not everybody in our organization is like a parent yet. So we kind of get left out of the family part of it. So there's a lot of things that we get skipped over. Um, so we try to create a space where uh, we can share kind of our a lot of mid twenties, uh, younger millennial, older Gen Z, kind of things like that. What we're, uh, what our members are need help with or want to talk to uh, folks about. Absolutely. So, how does somebody become a part of that? Um, what are some of the requirements? Um, a little bit more about that, I think, would be really interesting to some of our participants. Oh, yeah, for Young Democrats or? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, okay. As long as you're under 36 and you support progressive policies or you consider yourself a Democrat, um, I think one of our eboard members, Selena, is in the audience. If she wants to drop the link to our uh, Google form to join, it's we don't uh, take any dues or anything. We try to make our organization as accessible as possible. Um, we are still working virtually, so or doing virtual things. So outreach has been a little bit tougher, but um, yeah, just we've got, we get a lot of folks that work in government just because we're the Richmond chapter, but um, we're trying to work on getting folks out in Henrico, out in Powhatan, out in Petersburg. Um, yeah, as long as you're 13 years old to 36 and a Democrat awesome. in the area. Oh, I see the link. Okay, that's yep. very helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Selena. Um, so one thing, so like Virginia legislator, the session, um, in a nutshell, um, can you explain the process kind of bit by bit and like the simplest layman's terms as you possibly could? Sure. Um, and I think Kenny's probably going to talk about this later and Daquan talked a little bit about it. Um, so our legislative session happens, starts in January. Um, and I'm already going to start getting confusing every other year. It's 45 days um, and I was one year it's 45 and then it goes to 90 days. But most of the time they do a ex special extension um, to from the 45 days just to do it 90. But that's just something that hasn't been changed in the code. Um, <laughs> but uh, from January to about mid-March, um, all the legislators come down. Um, it sounds like summer camp in a way to some people, um, but they all come down. It's where the bulk of the lawmaking happens. Um, it's where bills get, you know, 
put into committees. It's where uh, stakeholder meetings happen. So folks that have um, any bit of interest in bills meet with legislators. Um, sometimes they are trying to kill your bill. Sometimes they're trying to make it a more inclusive thing. Um, and I think there's a lot of subject experts that come from very, what seems like super specific um, organizations or there's super specific topic experts. Um, some people will come drive five hours from Southwest um, to make one, make sure that they get to talk face to face with legislators and make one um, change or one add one line to the end of a bill because it would help their community get this or it would make sure their community is not affected by that. Um, and about midway through February is when uh, it's called um, crossover. That's like the last day where bills that are stuck in the Senate um, have to get out of the Senate and House bills can get out of the House by then. And if they don't, then it kind of just dies. And if you've ever seen um, Harry Potter, the part where the very first movie where all of the little paper mache or origami birds just kind of stop flying and fall, that's what it feels like if they don't get through. That was a very specific vis visual also if you haven't seen the Harry Potter movies. But um, yeah, we get tons of groups. We get like Girl Scouts coming through. Uh, there's college organizations that come through. Um, seems like almost every day is a different organization or specific causes like Advocacy Day. Um, there's Delta Day, so like Delta Sigma Theta does a really big, that's one of my favorite days because they just organ, like they know what they're doing every single year, it's the same day. Uh, they do like a breakfast in the morning with their organization and then they come and uh, we get, like our office gets the Prince William chapter coming through to talk about the priorities um, that they support. Um, and sometimes there's organizations that'll bring, it's not all like, oh, we just, we want you to sign this. And, you know, we're so supportive of it. Some will be like, we have a serious problem with this and we need to talk about it right now. Um, which can be really intimidating, I think, for um, people who aren't paid to do like the face-to-face -face kind of confrontational work part of it. Um, it's a skill that I don't think I have in me. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, it's long days. It can be very long nights sometimes. Um, and the crossover day, they sometimes have gone into like two in the morning um, and then they gavel out and whatever didn't make it dies. And then they'll be in committee at like 7 a.m. the next morning. Um, it is a lot of fun to, you get to meet constituent groups. Most of the time there's not any like terrifying constituent groups, except uh, the past few years, unfortunately, there's been some organizations that kind of take over Martin Luther King Day um, and just make it a not welcoming environment for anybody. But aside from that, it can be really fun um, to see, you know, there's grandmas that come through and talk about seniors and aging uh, problems in nursing homes. And then there's like the Girl Scouts who every year come with like a different legislative issue. I think this past year they were doing crosswalks and making them more accessible for blind folks. Um, and it's just really, I think it's a very interesting space to see the different things that people care about. Some are so, it seems so little to us. My cat is right there. Um, but it's just, it's gonna make a huge difference in a community. Um, and this past year it's been virtual, which has been a very big adjustment, I think for the legislative part of it and also for the advocates. Um, yeah, sorry, I feel like I just talked forever, but I hope that was the nutshell. <laughs> Uh, answer that you're looking for. Yeah, I think there's a lot to it. And I think you really explained it really well. Um, at least for me, like, I, it seems like it's just a lot. Um, but that was really helpful. Another thing. So, like, personally, like, if somebody were to come up to you and just ask, you know, how do I advocate? You know, um, I think the lack of knowledge on how to advocate for something that's, you know, personal to them or personal to um, their community. 
Um, is there anything that we can do? Um, so obviously as an advocacy agency, is there anything that we could do to help, um, you know, people in the community um, be able to advocate better? Um, you know, what would be the steps that you would explain to somebody if they just had absolutely no clue? Um, like, where would you start? You know, how would they make the right connections? Stuff like that. So I think the biggest thing, and this is kind of where I like my like work with advocacy coming in, um, there's people who like call our office and they're like, I'm having this issue um, and we'll work on it. But the hardest part is some people will just give us a very basic problem um, that for us, it's like, I have to go and look in the code where this is a problem and things like that. Um, but something that I always encourage folks to do is find an organization um, that centers what you are looking for assistance with. And that's not gonna happen for everybody, right? Um, someone who's trying to get a very specific sidewalk done, that's not, there's not many sidewalk associations or enthusiasts that are advocating at the General Assembly. But um, organization, there's a lot of organizations that cover a large range of things, um, like New Virginia Majority, they cover criminal justice, um, housing policy, immigration policy, um, just a whole plethora of things. Um, so I encourage folks to find an organization and that's, I sometimes people will call and they're not sure. Um, so I'll be like, oh, well, this is um, the, New Virginia majority, or this is CASA in action, or this is CARE in action, um, which are some of like just groups that are, they've been around, um, they kind of know the relationships that people have, how, where certain legislators um, stand on certain policies. Uh, they have like a very well-established, all of those groups have a ve very well-established relationship and um, reputations. So I encourage folks to find them um, and even just sometimes writing a letter to legislators, um, definitely have people read it. Sometimes you just need a second set of eyes on it. Um, but yeah, that would, I, sometimes you just kind of, not to say that you have to put it all out there to find, but um, there's definitely communities that I don't think are as publicly well known that people can find things like that. Kenneth just put a link in there, um, a free leader leadership and advocacy training program to anybody um, who can look at the chat. That may be something that would be very helpful, um, especially what um, Melina was just talking about. Um, one last question for you, and I think I fall into this category. So um, the term slacktivism, right? Um, so that's kind of thrown out a lot when it comes into like working with the younger generation and you kind of already spoke on that. Um, I think, um, Mr. Love also was talking about how social media is a major factor in advocacy today. Um, however, there, there's like a lack of advocacy, like people will repost or like, but there's not much action going on. Um, is there something that you know, young adults can um, take part in if they're not willing to um, become a part of, you know, the Young Democrats. Um, but how can we change that term? You know, I mean, that's kind of not cool. Like we are the future, right? Um, so I think that's really important. And I think the work that you're doing um, plays a big part in it as well. So if you kind of just want to touch on how the younger generation really does have a, um, a great amount of opportunity. Um, and what can we do? Yeah, so I think social media definitely has a weird um, hold and also a weird, like it's just a very weird new medium that we are all still trying to figure out. Um, I'm 25, so I remember I was still a little bit too young when Facebook first started. Um, and that was kind of like, I think MySpace was like the first social media that people used. Um, I think it's definitely become a tool, but also it can be 
I think people sometimes think it's the only tool to use. Um, but I, and I'm not like, I have a very weird, I'm like very 50, 50 with how I feel about social media. Um, I think it's something that people like, people weren't able to see everything that was happening, right? Like, I think there's a lot that people don't know about. And like, I, for example, on TikTok, I get tons of videos about it's indigenous um, folks from Hawaii. And I wouldn't know about the current battle for land with public development that um, folks in Hawaii are having right now and how that like, if that didn't come up on my For You page, I would have been in the dark about it. And I've gotten really into learning about it. And I, there's been a little bit of like a, like there's articles that are published about it, um, kind of in reaction to some of these videos going viral. Um, but as far as like social media specifically, um, I think people can use it to find things about like, what am I trying to say? find things to help with their education of certain things, but not completely rely on it. Um, I think that it is a tool that helps a lot of people organize. I think it's a really good tool for that. Um, but as far as like relying on it completely to advocate, I do not recommend that. I don't know. Like I said, I have a very 50-50 relationship with it. So it's like, in Young Democrats, we use it um, to do things like today was National Voter Registration Day. So like putting a tweet out about that, making sure folks know, and then all of us retweet it and maybe somebody will see it on their feed and they're like, oh my God, like I didn't even know there was, what am I gonna be registering to vote for this year? And then they look it up and they're like, oh my God, there's a governor's race this year. That's like the hope, right? Um, so yeah. I don't think I answered that question really well, but. Um, no, that was good. I mean, I think the major part of like using social media is, you know, being able to reach a larger audience. Um, but it's that idea that, I mean, I think I may have that that's all I got to do, right? Just repost and then that's it. Like, that's all I needed to do. Um, so I think it's helpful um, to find other outlets um, and being able to like research on it. So like you said, like being able to be like, oh, I can register, but like, what am I going to do? Like long-term, um, following up, I think is a big thing. Um, may, and I mean, I'm just throwing it out there that maybe young people struggle with, um, the follow through. Um, so, you know, maybe that's something that, um, needs to be addressed, you know, and I think that's being addressed with the young Democrats. I think that's really important, um, the engagement, um, making, you know, our voices heard. So I think that is really awesome. Um, I am going to open up the floor if anybody has any questions so far. I see some stuff happening in the chat. Thank you, Mr. Love. That was helpful. Yeah. A question. You're welcome. Yes. So, when I got the, uh, sorry, I'm not showing my face just a second. Um, but uh, when I got the flyer, it was saying av advocacy. Is this is this particularly for um, sorry? I was I was I probably came in on the wrong um, seminar. What are you trying to ask? I'm trying to ask is this, this is, uh, it says Joint Star for Virginia Recovery Month Advocacy uh, Seminar. Mm -hmm. uh, no, so I'm thinking they're going to show, share their advice on how to better advocate for their community. So I was trying to see, I, I, I didn't know if I was, it seemed like it was more of a political agenda. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Um, should I disconnect or am, am I right? Or no, we hope that you stay on. You're, you know, you're more than welcome yes. to be here. It, um, it is some about how to advocate for the things that you're looking for. It's also, um, you know, the, the beliefs of the people that are on the panel. So you're getting a little bit of both. 
And if you have any okay. questions for anybody at Sarah, you're welcome to call us and see, you know, what other avenues we have yeah. to help you learn some more things about advocacy. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, just to, for me, uh, sorry to interrupt anyone. My name is Terrell. I, I work with uh, the mental health of, a, of Virginia. I was a peer line support. Um, um, I'm, I'm a Navy veteran, retired Navy veteran. Um, I have a bachelor's in business. I'm working on my master's. Um, so yeah, so it's just a little bit about me. I was just trying to get the concept of uh, what was really going on. But I, I guess, so, so for me, I think we should, um, for being an advocate of a community, I don't think it should be marginalized to a certain group because that's what causes a lot of divide and that's what's been um, in division within, our, within the country. Um, I say for for a while, and it's it's just um, having being educated and knowing um, what, like you said, what you want to advocate for, and having those resources um, for the individual so they can better help their community. Um, so that's what I I pretty much stand for. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but thank you. No, you're fine. You didn't interrupt at all. But thank you for speaking. Does anybody else have any questions for Melina before we move on to Kenneth? I like this definition of advocacy, standing up against the masses to be a voice of the few. I like that a lot. I think we all can hopefully relate to that, um, having a passion about something um, and being able to advocate for that, I think is really important. Kenneth, I'm gonna give you the floor to introduce yourself. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Kenneth Gilliam and I'm the policy director um, for an organization called New Virginia Majority. Um, and so most of our work is based in central, northern and northern Virginia, as well as the Hampton Roads area. Um, and our organization in particular, we work on a number of issues um, that impact the lives of uh, low-income folks, communities of color, uh, women, young people, and immigrants um, throughout the state. Um, and we have done a lot of work to more broadly ensure that Virginia is really a place for, for all of us and that we all have the tools and resources to thrive, um, not only individually, um, but also um, within our communities. Um, and so, as I said, I talked a little bit about like, our, like being a policy director at New Virginia Majority, um, but I think, I guess a part of the question too is talk a little bit about how I got here. Um, and I wanna say that a lot of times we talk about advocacy or being an advocate, um, folks think that you have to have a title or you have to belong to a particular organization. Um, I think that each of us have our own lived experiences um, for better or worse that have really shaped who we are. And that when there are issues that are really important to us um, that impact our daily lives, we are truly the experts on those issues and have the best tools and resources to advocate on issues that we care about. Um, and so for me, when I think about how I became, a, I guess, an advocate really, um, it wasn't really a linear path. I didn't really know this was a career. I didn't know that people did this full time. And so for me, um, I'm a native Virginian. Um, I call both Petersburg and Chesterfield County home. Um, generations of my family have worked at Central State Hospital, uh, which for a very long time was the only mental health institution in the entire state that served um, Black folks in the entire state. And so for me, having the juxtaposition of living between both Petersburg and Chesterfield County at a very early age, I saw that where you lived, your zip code really determined what you had access to and the resources. And I would say it is not for like a lack of trying, is really because that there have been barriers that have been placed um, for a number of communities um, that have the impact whether that's access to uh, education or healthy food in your grocery stores. And so for me, my path to getting here, like I said, wasn't linear at all. Um, I originally started as a working in higher education um, as a student affairs professional working at Old Dominion um, University. Um, but before that, I was doing, uh, did some work doing K through 12 in higher ed policy, um, kind of started in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Um, and when I first got my start, I, I saw the ways in which public policy um, or the lack thereof impacted my students on campus. And I really wanted to get involved in advocacy work and policy work um, because I believe that changes in public policies um, is a pathway to change the lived experiences of everyday folks in our communities. Um, and so one day I had a leadership program that I had for my students. Um, and we had Senator McClellan, who happens to be my current state senator, um, came and spoke to our students about the need to really, the things that they're really passionate about, that those are things they really need to pursue um, and really do. And I told my students that every day, whether that is one-on-one -on -one sessions um, or just through our other leadership programs. And so really the next day, um, I emailed an old boss in Atlanta, said, hey, I really wanna get back into this work, but I have no idea how to do it. Um, and she introduced, she told me about a, a fellowship program, which will be like a two year policy program um, where I can really get my feet wet really into the policy advocacy work and being an advocate. Um, but the application closed in, in a week. And so I threw everything together, didn't think I would get it. Um, and I actually interviewed, had five interviews and one was for an organization called the Commonwealth Institute here in Virginia, um, which I really wanted to do. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't get funding for a fellow that year, so I didn't get the fellowship. Um, and so they said, they, hey, we'll just keep in touch with you. Um, and people say that all the time, so I didn't really think much about it. And so literally a month later, they called me back and they created a job for me. Um, and my first job was really working on um, it, Medicaid expansion. Um, and so working with over, I coordinated a coalition of over 110 organizations, including um, Sarah of Virginia, um, to get Medicaid expanded here in Virginia, which has now helped over a half a million folks get access to healthcare coverage. Um, and so that's kind of really the arc of my journey. And in 2019, I joined a new Virginia majority um, as our government, government affairs manager. Um, and at the time I was our only policy staffer. Um, and three months later, my um, three months later, I got promoted to being our policy director. And I've been in that role now for about two and a half years. And so I share all of that to say, is that our lived experiences shape the things that we really care about and things that we're passionate about. And it doesn't have to be a linear um, process. You don't have to say, okay, this is the issue I care about. I went to this training program. I talked to this person and now I'm an advocate. It is not a linear path at all. But I think that our lived experiences really shape the things that we care about and also how we um, engage in this work and how we enter this work as well. Thank you. That was really helpful. One thing that, I mean, a lot of what you said um, was really great. One thing you were talking about um, being an expert, right? So we are the experts in our community. Um, you know, our lived experience really does play a major part um, in why we advocate and how, you know, advocating, you know, how it's beneficial when somebody with lived experience, you know, it's more personal, right? Um, so you did talk about um, you work in policy. So can you kind of describe to us um, the process of a bill becoming a law? Um, if you just wanna go through that. Sure. Um, and so I know we talked a little bit about some of the things that folks cared about. Um, what's an issue that folks care about, I guess, on the chat? Um, either you can put it uh, in the chat or you can just say it out loud, but what is a, a issue that's really important to you? Housing, okay. Um, and so, for example, just say you have a delegate or a senator, um, and typically what happens is that when our legislators, they put in bills, a lot of those bills really begin with conversations from folks in their communities. And so they're, you're, you are their constituents. And so the pieces of legislation that they typically um, put in are typically rooted in what's happening in their communities and from folks that talk that, um, that they talk to every day. And so typically a bill is drafted or submitted by a, a legislator. And then once the General Assembly starts um, in January, so our next General Assembly session starts um, the second week in January, um, all the bills that were submitted, it gets assigned to a particular committee. And the committee is a combination or just a few members of the House of Delegates or the State Senate. And that is where the, the legislative process really begins. And so there are public hearings, there are debates and committees about pieces of legislation. And in committees, bills can be amended. Um, they can die in committee, which means they don't go through, um, or they can just simply be voted um, all the way through. And so sometimes you have a subcommittee, which is like a smaller group, you have a full committee. 
And then once your piece of legislation gets through the committee process, it then goes to the floor. And by the floor, it means like, for example, the floor, the chamber of the House of Delegates, where all 100 members of the um, House get to see it for the first time. And then in the state Senate, we have 40 senators, and that's where all the members um, in the state Senate have an opportunity to, to see and hear the, the bills. And what happens is once they are in the particular chamber, they have what's called three readings. Um, and the, for the first reading, it would, um, is really just simply, they, they either put it in what's called a journal or they read the bill aloud. And then typically the next day, the bill goes on what's called second reading status. And your second reading is when the Senator or delegate introduces the bill on the floor. Um, it talks about what the bill does and, um, what, and what the outcome should be. And during your second reading, that's when it's, the bill is debatable. So changes are made, can be, changes can be made to the bill. Um, they can be amendments made to the bill and they can be either accepted or rejected. And then what we have is third reading status. Um, and that is when the, the delegates and senators, they vote on a particular piece of legislation. Um, and then it, they either vote yes and it passes and advances or they vote no and it dies in that particular chamber. And then what we have, what Melania mentioned earlier, is called crossover. And so the bills that originated in the House will go to the Senate. The bills that originated in the Senate will go through the House. And the whole process starts over again. So it goes to the committee, then it goes to the floor, and then it's one, one final vote. And so that's how, that's how we kind of get fair. And then lastly, sometimes you may have identical bills where um, they, the, the language is exactly the same. And so those are typically um, very easy. But sometimes you may have bills that are pretty much the same, but they kind of achieve the goal very differently. And that's what we have something called the conference committee, which is a small group of delegates and senators. They negotiate the final version of the bill, and then it goes back to the respective chambers for a vote. And then once it, it goes through the whole le legislative process, then it goes to the governor, where the governor, he or she or they, uh, they can uh, a vote, uh, sign it, they can amend it, or they can veto it. And so that's in a nutshell for the for the time that we have, that is really how the legislative process works in Virginia. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions later on. I can put my um, email address in the chat as well. Folks have other follow-up questions. How do we follow that process? Um, is there a, a link or is there, yeah, that would be helpful maybe to put in the chat. I'm gonna put a chat in here. Um, so th this is a link to a website called lis.virginia.gov. And so this is the website where you can see all the bills that typically get submitted. You can see the bills by members. And so if you want to see what piece of the legislation um, your delegate or senator has put in, you can see all of that information there. And then when we get into the legislative session, they have the calendar where you can follow the process of this bill would be in this committee. This is how I sign up. If I want to do public speaking or public comment, or either virtual, uh, either in person, um, verbally, or you can submit a written comment. And so all of that information is here. And like I said, I will put my email address in the chat as well. And I'm happy to answer those questions of folks if this is like their first time and they really want to dig in more. I'm happy to um, answer any, any questions via email as well. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I am going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open up the floor. Um, we are running low on time and I want to um, appreciate everybody's time. So as people, you know, we're coming together on this event. So a lot of us probably have um, different priorities um, and a lot of priorities. How do we prioritize those? Um, you know, it can be overwhelming as an advocate. There's so many things I feel like um, a lot of us are probably passionate about. Um, how do we break that down um, so we don't get overwhelmed? Um, we're able to put our best work into it. Um, is, are there any suggestions that you have? Have you had any experiences of, you know, it being just too much? Um, anything on that? Yeah, absolutely. And so I would say from personal experiences, um, we have had our organization, we have about eight policy buckets. And so the my first two sessions, I think we worked on like 90 or 100 bills. Um, but there we are paid staff, we do it full time and it can be, it can be very overwhelming. Um, and so you can be in the General Assembly from like six o'clock in the morning until maybe 11 o'clock at night and do it all over again. And so what I would say, particularly for folks who are just starting, pick, with, pick an issue that's really important to you and your family and your neighbors and your communities and really starting there. 
Um, and like I said, you do not have, this does not have to be your full-time job. You don't have to be a professional at it um, because everyone starts somewhere. And like I said, like you don't have to feel like you have to be a professional speaker and the advocacy looks very differently. So I know some folks who um, organized something their, uh, in their neighborhood and did like a, a postcard or letter writing campaign to their uh, state uh, legislator, state delegate to talk about issues that are important to them. And so what I would say is to start with the issue that's really important to you um, and begin to talk to your family about it. Um, talk to your neighbors and other folks uh, if you believe if you uh, belong to any um, religious institutions or other organizations, talk to people that you know about that issue and as a way to even just start in practice. And so I think that um, we have other folks on here who also do advocacy work too. And I think that honestly, start with the issue, go from there and learn as much as you can. And like I said, if this is the issue that is a part of your lived experiences, no one can talk about that issue better than you can. It, no matter how much research or data other folks have, it, if it is your personal lived experiences, you are the expert on that issue. And so definitely walk into those spaces knowing um, that you belong there, that your story is important, and that you are truly the expert. And so I think that sometimes we think that, like, oh, I didn't finish high school, or I didn't go to college, I can't do these things. You don't need any of that. Your own lived experiences are all you need to start. And I definitely hope that other folks find pathways to, to do so. That's awesome. That, that's very inspiring, I think, for maybe a lot of us. Um, so I just want to open up the floor for the next six or seven minutes. Um, for anybody that has any questions or comments or any ideas, um, I'll just leave it up to y'all. Um, and I would just say that I know New, New Virginia majority, we have different chapters. And one thing we typically do every year before legislative session, we do like a deep dive into like the legislative process and talk about um, all the information. How, and if people are interested, definitely happy to share information if you want to um, join one of those two, even just to kind of dig in more and just learn more about the legislative process or even how to get involved um, in the General Assembly session as well. One thing I'm going to do um, for the seminar is I'm going to send out a follow up email um, with the link to the video so you can share it with your network, um, as well as the resources that we have listed, which I think are going to be very helpful to us. Um, Kenneth keeps dropping them. Thank you. Um, so I think that'll be really helpful for everybody. Um, and if anybody needs any follow up information, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, to us at Sarah, um, and we'd be willing to give you some information that we have available. Thanks, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. So Kenneth, if they have questions about the like getting the, into the deeper dive of advocacy, can they just email you? Yes, they can email me. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Well, I feel really well informed. I don't know about y'all. Um, this was very helpful for me. Um, I think that I did learn a lot. Um, are y'all, um, are all three of y'all, Melina and, oh, you already dropped it. Um, so um, Melina, are you okay? Um, if we, if they, I give out the information for um, the Young Democrats. Yes, and I can also drop my Young Dems email. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. cool. As a political director, we're trying to work on making more, um, almost like a guidebook on things like how to advocate, even just kind of what is the General Assembly. Um, 
and we're hopefully working on even things like this is what labor, you know, kind of things like that, trying to do not only like 101s, but also ABCs, which I think is where yes. a lot of people, there's a lot of implied knowledge. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of in this space sometimes like to use um, the biggest words and just the, you know, thing like I'm Googling half of the things that my colleagues say all the time. Um, so they help expand my vocabulary, but um, making it a lot more accessible for folks who I think in Virginia, we do Virginia history in fourth grade. And then that's like the last time you talk about the general assembly. Um, and fourth grade for me was probably 20 years ago. So, okay, not 20, but it was a long time ago. Um, so I think a lot of folks could definitely, uh, it will help refresh memories and will also help people, you know, there's probably outdated information that people have about certain processes. So um, we won't have it by the time that the follow-up email is sent, but <laughs> just know that we'll be working on it. Please keep us updated on that. That'll be a great resource, I think, to get out into the community. So that's great. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody that came, um, especially um, our speakers. And if anybody doesn't have anything else, um, we can end it here. Thank you all for attending. And to you, Kenneth, Melina, and Daquan, appreciate y'all. Greatly. In you know, your information and your input. Wealth of knowledge between the three of y'all. I love yeah. it. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys take care and um, stay safe out there. Thank you.